I knew from when I was in high school that I wanted to make a difference in this world. For me, a career in science seemed like the best way to address some of the problems that the world is facing. This year, I had a shot at that life goal. I am one of the co-lead investigators in UQ's program to create a COVID vaccine. I'm also one of the inventors of the underlying technology that looked like it would make this a reality. We were close, but it didn't quite pay, play out the way we had hoped. Right now, there are tens of millions of doses of our vaccine. We've shown that it's safe and that it can generate an immune response that's likely to be just as protective as any of the other candidates being progressed and it's sitting in freezers likely to never be used. It's just a tad soul destroying, but a vaccine needs to be perfect in every way. The vaccine we produce is what is called a subunit vaccine. For this, we just produce a part of the virus and not the whole thing. For COVID, we just make the spike protein that sticks out from the surface of the virus, but it's held in the right shape so that it exactly matches the shape that is present on the virus. The spike is held together by what we call the molecular clamp. You can think of the molecular clamp like a bulldog clip, holding the protein together so that it's in the exact same shape as was present on the virus surface. We give this as a vaccine to teach the body's immune system what to be on the lookout for. So it's important that the shapes exactly match. The issue with our vaccine is that the molecular clamp technology is based on a small fragment of one of the HIV proteins. We chose this fragment because it is well understood and a highly stable structure. It is so stable, in fact, that you would have to heat this bulldog clip up to about 90 degrees before it would open and drop its papers. We knew that people who received this vaccine would likely generate a response to the sequence within the molecular clamp. We also knew that it was a possibility that this response could be cross-reactive to some of the HIV diagnostics. All participants were advised that there was a possibility of falsely testing positive for HIV. However, we didn't think that was likely. However, science is hard and that's exactly what happened. It in no way diminished the immune response that would be protective against COVID. But if the vaccine was used in a population wide scale, it would create problems for HIV diagnosis. It's disappointing and frustrating, yes, but in science, this isn't unusual. This type of thing happens every day just not usually in the middle of a global pandemic and vaccine race when the eyes of the whole world are upon you. The fact that this vaccine will not progress does not diminish all of the work that went in by many of people to its development. And so to honour the work that everyone has contributed, I'd like to highlight exactly what goes into a vaccine. To do that, we need to go back in time all the way to 2011. At the time, I was thinking about the need for something like a clamp to stop the proteins I was working on from falling apart. That was when the idea came to me to use the highly stable structure within GP41 from HIV as a clamp to hold these proteins into the correct shape and then use them as a vaccine. As is the first step with any a great idea, I discussed this with my best mate over a few beers at the pub. Dan Watterson is not only my best mate, but he is a work colleague and the most passionate and intelligent scientist that I know. Dan and I usually enjoy discussing some crazy and out there ideas. However, we both knew that this was legitimately a good idea and we could both see the potential. We then pitched it to our boss, Paul Young, who has always been a supportive and great mentor. And Paul gave us the go ahead to work on this as a side project. It was around a year before we got the first results showing that this technology could work. This was with a virus called respiratory syncytial virus that is a common cause of bronchiolitis in young children. It was then another five years of working on this as a side hustle before we received the first funding for this work, to support this work. Over that time, we'd shown that the technology worked for eight different viruses, including Ebola, influenza, and Middle East respiratory coronavirus. Over that time, I wrote and applied for 12 separate research grants, all of which were unsuccessful. And then finally, 13th time lucky, I received my first grant in 2018. It was a year later that we received $15 million from CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. This was to use the CLAMP technology to establish a rapid response vaccine pipeline. The idea being that we would have three years to put in place 
everything that was required. So if hypothetically the world was confronted by a global pandemic, we would be ready. We were just one year into that project when the world was confronted with the perfect storm of a virus. One that could spread silently before people even knew that they were sick. One that was just mild enough in the majority of people that some within the community would deny it was even a problem. And one that would go on to cause the hospitalizations and deaths of millions of people within 2020. This was COVID-19. We had only just hired and trained our new team and set up our new lab. We had never even produced a vaccine for a clinical trial. In any other year and by any other definition, we were not ready. But we had a bunch of scientists and a plan in place and we were willing to give it everything that we could. When reports of a new virus first emerged, none of us thought that it would explode the way that it did. At first, we thought of it just as a good means to test out new technologies that we were working on. On January 12th, when the sequence of this new virus was released by Chinese authorities, we could get to work. You see, to start our process for producing a vaccine, all we need is that sequence of A's, G's and C's and T's that encode the virus DNA. On the very day that the sequence was released, we submitted an online order for DNA. And six days later, a bunch of tiny tubes arrived in the mail and we were away. For the next four weeks, we worked in shifts with stacks of lab consumables piling to the roof. Notes and lists and codes were scribbled on paper so we could keep track of what we were doing. WhatsApp messages were flying amongst the team so we could coordinate tag team activities so we, people could sleep without the work pausing for a minute. In those four weeks, our view of the unfolding outbreak quickly changed from, this is a good test case, to, oh shit, this is a real thing. In those four weeks, we had no idea whether what we were working on would actually work or whether we would fail when it came to the crunch. A phrase that constantly circulated in the lab was there are no guarantees in science. We produced and screened over 200 versions of the vaccine over those four weeks to select the version that was easiest to produce at high levels and that was likely to be the best match for this new virus we knew little about. We had to weed out any versions that wouldn't work as we knew there was be little time later on to come back and start again. We also knew that any improvements we could make in production would likely translate to additional doses available down the line. On Valentine's Day, February 14th, just 35 days after the sequence was released, we had selected a lead and produced just enough vaccine to immunize mice. From then on, it was one thing after another. Every day was a roller coaster ride of ups and downs. There was a thousand different problems to solve and a thousand different ways in which the project could fail. Our team grew constantly over this time with us needing to bring in experts and collaborators across all the different areas. We have collaborations with ANU, University of Melbourne, CSIRO, and many private companies who are with us every step of the way. By this stage, our team was not just limited to scientists. There were many other people working around the clock to make this dream a reality. The university's legal team were working in overdrive to put in place all of the legal agreements that underpinned this work. 117 separate legal agreements were drafted, negotiated and executed over this time. Our finance team needed to keep track of all of the donations coming in from many different sources and being spent by us just as quickly. Over $20 million was being spent on this work. The comms team as well were run off their feet with hundreds of articles being published on the UQ COVID vaccine. Throughout it all, we watched the case numbers and death toll climb. Already by April, 7,000 people were dying every day. That weight weighed heavy on all of us. How could we move this along more quickly was weighed up against the knowledge that healthy volunteers would be needed for testing. If we got anything wrong, they would be the ones who could be harmed. The stakes were as high as they come as any potential mistake could jeopardise the already shaking public confidence in vaccines. Any negative outcome could not only affect our vaccine but could extend to the other vaccine developers working on the same thing. With the eyes of the world upon us, a negative outcome could also impact the well-proven vaccines that are currently in use. By July, we had this. 
This is the dose of the vaccine that was used in the clinical trial. This was a mammoth achievement that is completely invisible. You can't see the vaccine because it is smaller than the wavelength of light. To see this vaccine, you need to use an electron microscope that will fire a beam of electrons through the sample. But by using this technique, we were able to generate this. This is a 3D model of the vaccine, almost down to the atomic scale. By using this technique, we were able to see that the vaccine is in the exact same shape as the spike on the surface of the coronavirus. This part here on the bottom is the clamp, holding the three molecules of the spike together. In each dose of this vaccine, there are 15 micrograms of the protein we designed. That's 15 one thousandth of a one thousandth of a gram. That's as much as if you took one single grain of salt and cut it in four and said, oh no, I don't like a lot of salt, and threw three pieces away. 15 micrograms is not a lot, but in actual raw numbers, it equates to 15 trillion spike molecules. That's 15 with 12 zeros after it. 15 trillion spike molecules sitting in a syringe waiting to be injected into somebody's arm. Because it is such a minuscule amount, one quarter of a grain of salt of a highly purified protein, we need to include an adjuvant. Otherwise, the body wouldn't even recognize that it was there. The adjuvant is what triggers a danger signal so that your immune system will mount a response against the vaccine. The adjuvant we used in our clinical trial was MF59. This is an organic compound produced from shark liver oil. MF59 has been used in flu vaccines for over 20 years and over 100 million doses has been given. So it has a well and truly proven safety track record. In the clinical trial, when we tested this vaccine, we were able to show that it was completely safe and it seemed to work well. 75% of the participants who received this vaccine generated a neutralizing immune response that was more effective than the average COVID-19 patient. And in just under 40% of participants, there was an immune response that was twice that level. However, there was a problem. The clamp component at the base of the molecule was creating an immune response that was being picked up on some HIV diagnostics. Participants in the trial were testing positive for HIV even though they didn't have HIV. Throughout this year, the team had worked their way through thousands of different problems, but this was one we hadn't foreseen. It could be fixed, but it would take time and mean starting over. Up until then, we had hit every timeline we set for ourselves through sheer determination, and by telling ourselves that even a single week's delay would mean lives we couldn't save. We now have tens of millions of doses of a COVID vaccine in freezers ready and waiting, but to use these would mean disruption of the systems put in place to detect people still being infected by another pandemic. The HIV pandemic has been raging for 40 years and 33 million individuals have lost their lives. In addition, many people may think that a false positive for HIV is not a big deal in exchange for protection against the much bigger threat that is COVID. However, there is still stigma associated with those three letters, HIV, and there's no real way to know how those negative effects could flow on to this vaccine program and as well as others. We have therefore stepped back from our efforts to develop a COVID vaccine. However, we will be even more prepared if or when the next pandemic occurs. There are many other viruses without a treatment or vaccine for which our next version of this technology could, and I hope will, be effective. This year has been a roller coaster ride. It has been intellectually stimulating, challenging, and at times frustrating. It has been emotionally and physically draining beyond anything I could have imagined. But watching my colleagues within Australia and around the world rise to the challenge has been inspiring and has affirmed in me that science is the place where I want to be to make a positive impact in the world. The recent developments that have placed a hold on our vaccine do not change that or diminish it in any way. Science can save lives and change the world, but science is hard. You won't get it right every time. It won't go the way you expect or the way the world hopes. But the important thing is that when it doesn't go your way, you pick yourself up, dust off your lab coat and give it another shot.